I want to thank you all for having me back again. Uh, as Lewis said, my name is Michael, and uh, I'm currently a chaplain fellow at the, the VA, and uh, I've been there for almost six months now. Uh, I was at JCMC with Lewis about a year. Uh, well, I was at JCMC for a year. I was with Lewis about six months, right? Um, so I work at the VA. I myself am a, a veteran. Uh, I joined the military when I was 18 years old, uh, spent uh, 12 years. 75% uh, of that time was with the Marine Corps Infantry, and uh, I did go to Iraq and Afghanistan. And in Afghanistan, I had a, a chaplain, uh, you know, we, we hit the deck um, at a Camp Leatherneck, and we were about to go to, uh, to our actual duty station in, in Afghanistan, and the chaplain had, a, had an opportunity to talk to our entire company. I'm sure that he talked to the entire battalion, but uh, he told us, you know, you take, you take the Taliban out of the equation, you know, just take the Taliban out of the equation, and Afghanistan itself is a very dangerous place. You know, just to, just to cross the land itself is very dangerous. And he said, you know, if you just take the time to look around in this country, you know, and, and have these experiences and experience these feelings, um, you just might find God, you know. And uh, I experienced some of those things, uh, and I experienced some of those feelings as well. And I think that Afghanistan is where I truly met God. Uh, I tell you this part of my story because, you know, it connects with a lot of uh, different veteran stories as well. Um, and during this presentation, I want to talk a little bit about the veteran community. Um, out of 329 million people that live in the U.S. today, only 1% currently serve in the military. Only 1% of our population do we ask to go into harm's way and defend our country. Only 1% of our population do we ask to go in our stead so that we can be at home working our jobs, being with our family. Only 1% of our population do we say to suffer the hardships of being away from your family, be constantly fearful for your life, go forth and take life if necessary, suffer the guilt and shame that comes with that. Needless to say, there's a lot of different injuries that a service member can, uh, can suffer from uh, through constant exposure to all the many things in combat, uh, both physical and emotional, but I want to start off with one of the mo most basic ones. Um, and the, the military itself is a culture. It's a, it's a subculture within the greater American culture. And when I was in, when I was in active duty, um, I was surrounded by military members. My family was surrounded by military members. When I was deployed, you know, once again, surrounded by military members. My family was surrounded by other families who their loved ones were gone as well. So they had a huge support network. Uh, we literally were a tribe of warrior families who supported one another in ways that is hard to find in the world these days. So to transition from that tribe, like life, to a new place or even your hometown, to a new place or even your hometown is a difficult thing for a veteran. You know, I... Uh, Oftentimes, I, I've heard it described, you know, I, I feel like an alien in a strange land, a stranger in a strange land, you know, because it's just like the, the shift is just so great. You know, you, uh, we go from a unit of people who support and care for us to an apartment or a cul-de-sac surrounded by people who don't care for us at all. I remember in, a, in a, our first house in Washington at my last duty station, um, we saw my neighbor, I saw my neighbor, I don't know, maybe Tammy saw her more. I saw my neighbor one time in that year that I lived there. And the only reason that I saw her was because uh, what she would do is she would open up her garage, pull her car out, close the garage, and leave. When she came back, she would open her garage, pull her car in, close the garage, and that was it. But one time we caught her. <laughs> <laughs> and we literally went right into her garage, and that's the only reason I ever got to meet her. <laughs> but yeah, so 
you're surrounded by people that, that don't know you and, and, you know, quite often they don't care. And even if we do find people who care, how can, how can they relate to the things that we've gone through as veterans? You know, and I'm not saying that, that it's impossible because, you know, if you try hard enough, you can. But, you know, that's, that's why you see the rise of all these different organizations like uh, the VFW, you know, biker clubs and, and even the VA where veterans can meet and talk about their issues with people like them. You know, I've heard it described, you know, even uh, even within these organizations, you know, the Vietnam vets will all sit in one table and then the, the Desert Storm vets will all sit in one table. And, you know, it, you know, it's, you know, we want to be around people that understand us and understand the things that we've gone through. Uh, so what are some of these issues? Uh, one of the, the most prevalent ones is uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. And this is a psychiatric disorder where somebody has either been a victim of or witnessed a traumatic event such as death, disaster, or even sexual violence. Uh, the result of this event is re-experiencing over and over uh, through dreams, flashbacks, uh, withdrawal from others, isolating, and emotional outbursts among other symptoms. Veterans may not be, may not seem to exhibit these symptoms of PTSD right away while deployed uh, because they don't have time to reflect on all that stuff. When we're in combat, we build up these, these barriers. We put on this armor. We put, we put this barrier in between ourselves and our feelings because, you know, we're sending rounds down range. We're, we're looking for the next target. We're, watching out for IEDs and stuff like that. But when we get home, we don't really need that armor. You know, those barriers start to start to shift and, and fall away. And then it's just a tsunami of, of emotions, of anger and sadness and all this stuff that comes out. We don't know how to deal with that. They don't teach us how to deal with that. They teach us how to kill the enemy, but they don't teach us how to deal with it. Um, and that's, that's a good point. You know, since the last time I talked to you, I found out in my learning, you know, that not a lot of people can understand this, but, you know, just veterans feel guilt over killing people. And it doesn't even have to be, you know, you know, uh, collateral damage or, or something like that. I mean, killing people doesn't feel good, you know, and, uh, even, even even if that killing is justified and, you know, the enemy has their, their weapon pointed at you, you have your weapon pointed at them, and you just happen to be able to pull your, pull your trigger first, you can feel guilty about that. And especially as Christians, we're all made in the image of, of uh, God, right? So are we killing the image of God? I mean, it's a good question. And it's something that people dwell on. After the fact, when they get home, it's just like, oh, my gosh, you know, people struggle with that. Um, it is not the severity of PTSD that brings people to the VA, but it's it's the spiritual dimension. I've, I've read that before. It's the loss of meaning and purpose in our life. I mean, we can we can live through terrible things, you know, but once we lose that meaning in our life, that purpose, wow, we need some help. We need to we need to have somebody come alongside us, and that's that just happens naturally. You know, I, they just come to the VA um, because they know they need somebody to talk to. And I believe that God uh, changed my life through IEDs, and I believe that my faith in God protected me from PTSD. To tell you the truth, I'm not saying that I that there's no symptoms or anything like that, but uh, I just thank God that you know. I don't suffer as much as some others do, and I, I try my best to come alongside them that do. Uh, moral injury. Moral injury can occur when we have broken the moral codes set down by our families, by our service, by society in itself. And <clears throat> this is, this is more, uh, it's deeper than just feeling guilt. You know, this is like something is like, who am I? I know this is wrong, and I just did this. I know it's wrong. I don't know who I am anymore. Uh, and in combat, once again, you have to move fast. You have to make split decisions. 
and sometimes bad things happen and sometimes we can't live with that uh, whether whether we meant for that to happen or not and I've heard moral injury described as a book okay and in this book you have many different chapters I mean you're born you go through adolescence maybe you go through college I don't know and then you join the military and you don't have to be in the military to have moral injury but then you have your moral injury okay <laughs> And that's the only chapter that you ever spend any time in. Soon, you forget who you were, and you, for, you lose the hope. You lose the hope of the person that you could be, you know? Um, it's, it's pretty debilitating. I actually, I've, I've talked to quite a few people who, who suffer from it, and, it, and it's, uh, you can just see the suffering in their face. Um, and this can also occur when, when we witness uh, something to this effect, but there's nothing that we can do about it. I'm reading this book uh, called War in the Soul. If you want to understand uh, veterans in combat, um, read that book, because it'll, it'll give you a good picture of it. It's written by Edward Tick, War in the Soul. Um, and he, he describes this incident in Vietnam where uh, this person's unit they they enter a village and they just start burning the village you know for no reason that's at least explained in the book but the, the the author of the story you know he's saying he he was in there protecting this one family that's all that he could do is protect this one family and he had to he had a decision i can protect this family and die or i can you know, go away and let this happen and just try to live with it. And I'm, I'm not exactly sure what his choice was. I don't think he, he wrote that down. But you know, when you go to combat, sometimes we get put in places that we shouldn't be put, uh, where we have to make decisions like that. Survivor's guilt. This is guilt based on having survived a traumatic event when others did not. And I can't even account, I can't even count uh, how many times I've heard these stories. I'm sure that some of you have as well. Some of you may have experienced some of these stories. Um, losing a buddy, you know, in, in just a, a pitched battle, you know, something as, as simple as as, oh, let me let me ride in in the right side of the Humvee this time. You know, I want to look at the look at the river. I don't want to I don't want to have to look at this city the the entire ride back. You know, and uh, you hit an IED and the left side of the of the vehicle is blown completely apart and that person dies. Mm -hmm. You feel guilty about that. I've talked to numerous veterans like that, uh, and it can also be due to a sexual attack and having feelings that somehow uh, the survivor is responsible for what happened to them, which that's never true, okay? Um, it's never true, which leads me to, to military sexual trauma. And, you know, military sexual trauma, rape or repeated sexual harassment that, occur that occurred in the military, but how is that different than, than it happening in, in the civilian world? It's, it's actually very different because the military has not always been, and still isn't, the greatest at dealing with, uh, with situations like that. And even today, uh, sometimes a survivor can still be working right next to their attacker on a, on a boat with 200 other people. They have no escape from that person. And that in itself is traumatic, I would think. I can't even imagine what that would feel like. Um, sometimes that attack, that attacker could be uh, in charge of of the person, and, and as ironic as it sounds, you know the military wanted to to hammer hammer this nail in, you know, as well as they possibly could, and the person that was charged with uh, with leading the committee to to combat, you know, military sexual trauma was himself uh, accused of military sexual trauma. So it's a, it's a terrible thing. Let's see here. 
There are many other ways that a veteran that make a veteran unique when it comes to hospitalization, especially at the VA. Um, I can't cover the, cover them all, but uh, Lewis talked about being a chaplain, uh, so I don't want to you know go back into that too much. But in my specific job, I'm I'm part of a I work on the locked mental health unit, uh, so I see this stuff every day. I see PTSD, moral injury, uh, survivor guilt every day, and you know, just I, I minister to them just like uh, Lewis talked about, but I'm also able to come alongside them in groups and kind of facilitate some group talk, you know, and that's that's where that community piece, that culture piece come back, comes back in because they're surrounded by people that have gone through the same things as them, at least, you know, on some level. And, you know, we uh, teach groups like uh, shame and guilt, anger management, uh, talking about whole spiritual health and stuff like that. Um, also forgiveness. Forgiveness is a huge one. Um, so I, I'm able to sit with them and kind of facilitate a group discussion. And a lot of times these people will open up and, and I think it's very healing for them to be able to do that. Um, and once they get off my floor, they will, they will eventually, you know, most likely go to, uh, what they call the domiciliary, which is that many different programs. They have a PTSD program. They have a substance abuse program. They have a homeless program. And I think, a a, a job seeking program where they can help you find a job and you can live at the domiciliary for up to, I think a year. And this is. Uh, Johnson City, the Mountain Home VA, has the largest domiciliary in the country. So a lot of people come all from all over the nation to to be a part of these programs. And the chaplains over there, um, they do a real good job, you know, doing this stuff and, and doing even more work with them. When they're not so, uh, a lot of the times, you know, they come to my unit to detox, get their meds kind of uh, uh messed around with to get the right, the right levels in them and stuff like that just so that they're thinking clearly and stuff like that and uh i do work with them there but then they also go to the dom and uh they're able to do work with them there as well uh so there's much more to speak about but i can't possibly cover it all um i just want you to understand a little bit about veterans you know because i don't for the most part, I, I don't do too much different than Lewis. I just I have a different demographic. It's just like you know, a hospice chaplain needs to know their demographic uh, more than just uh, regular patients and stuff like that. So, is there any questions that you all have? I'll answer them if I can. Is there a recommended way of? I'll say interacting with somebody that you know was in the military and had PTSD. Okay. Is it treated normally? I assume they don't want to hear "thank you for your service" every time you see them. You know that that is a that is a good point. You know the the Vietnam veterans they didn't get the welcome home. You know, and which was a huge huge disservice to them and and what they did for us, and they do welcome that. They, they like to hear that a lot, but from, from my own perspective and from talking to other veterans uh, of the OEF, OIF uh, generation, you know, I struggle a lot of the times with why I was even over there, you know, and I wonder what good I did over there. Uh, so I don't really like to hear that. Um, I'm not saying that you can't say it to anybody else. It's not like I'm going to, you know yell at you or anything but you know because that's that's just a nice thing to say you know but i don't know how well you know this person or, or the people that you're talking about but how you interact with somebody with ptsd if they are when i walk into a room in and, and i know that they that their their emotions are high and and they're in you know just in that mode you know i'll, I'll be very respectful and be like where would you like me to stand you know, because a lot of the times they want you to, they want to be in a specific area in the room. They want to be able to get to that exit 
if if they need to be, you know, um, need to do that. So I would just, you know, if somebody's in that mode, you know, I'll just be very respectful and and as as respectful as you can. I definitely would not try to provoke them, though. <laughs> yeah. Anybody else? Y'all can ask me questions. <laughs> Don't be afraid. All right. Well, thank you very much for having me here. I appreciate it.